welcome as we journey on in our look at the feasts of the Lord from Leviticus 23. We've been looking at them in two ways, prophetically and messianically. Prophetically from Leviticus 23 and how it relates to Israel and the Jewish people. It's very clear in that passage, in that chapter, that these Feasts are for the children of Israel. The church is not in view. But then we can look at Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17, which we have uh, throughout this series. And we see that the holy days, the feast days, for example, are shadows, illustrations, pictures, if you will, types of things to come, and that... Uh, uh, one to come, that thing to come, if you will, is Messiah, where it says the body, the substance, is Messiah. And so the feast days are pictures of Messiah as well and what he would do. So prophetically with Israel from Leviticus 23 and Messianic from Colossians chapter 2, it speaks of the Messiah, of Jesus, but nowhere does it talk about the feast being pictures or types of what would happen with the church. And that must be in our thinking as we understand how these feasts of Leviticus 23 picture coming things in the future. So today, we are going to look at Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement, picture of Israel and Messiah in prophecy. Yes, lesson six in this series. In Leviticus chapter 23, in verses 26 through 32, we are told about Yom Kippur, the day Yom Kippur covering or atonement. We are told this, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, remember, uh, Feast of Trumpets on the first day of the seventh month, we now come to the tenth day. Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. By the way, the Jewish people understand today that uh, afflicting your souls meanings meaning to fast. And so for 24 hours prior to the Day of Atonement, they will fast. But you shall afflict your souls and offering, offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening on the evening, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Now, Leviticus chapter 16 gives a lot more details on how the nation of Israel was to practice Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It goes into a lot of details. We're just going to look at a few of the uh, details in that chapter. But one thing we should understand that Leviticus 16 was a national day of forgiveness. The high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, first in the tabernacle, later in the temple when that was built, and offer the blood of a sacrificed lamb for the sins of the nation. So it was a national offering. 
It was an offering, a blood offering, for the sins of the nation of Israel done by the high priest. We are told in <clears throat> Leviticus 16 and <clears throat> verses 20 through 22. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. The point I want us to see in these verses is that this offering, Yom Kippur offering, was a national offering. In verse 21, we are told that the iniquities of the children of Israel would be put on this live coat, of all the people in the nation. Again, verse 21, all their transgressions, all their sins. And he would carry those sins out into the wilderness, that coat. It was a national day of forgiveness. Now, there were two lambs that made up the one sin offering, according to Leviticus 16. One lamb was offered as a blood offering. In Leviticus 16, verse 5, we are told, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats, two young, innocent, small goats, for a sin offering. One ram for a burnt offering. Now, the ram was the offering for the high priest. The goats, the two goats, would be the offering for the nation of Israel. But notice what it says in the text. There are two goats, but there's only one offering. One sin offering made up of two goats. Then we are told in verse 7, and he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And verse 8 tells us, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So it would be determined one of these goats would become the Lord's. The other would become the scapegoat. Then verse 9 tells us, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. He would be sacrificed. He would be slaughtered. And his blood would be brought ultimately into the Holy of Holies by the high priest and sprinkled on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. So you have that one goat who is a blood offering. The other lamb or goat was the scapegoat. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, dictionary.com defines scapegoat this way. Number one, a person or group made to bear the blame for others or to suffer in their place. And secondly, it says, chiefly biblical, a goat let loose in the wilderness on Yom Kippur after the high priest symbolically laid the sins of the people on its Head. And it gives those verses from Leviticus 16. So a scapegoat is one who suffers unjustly, one who takes the punishment for someone else. And it goes back to what happened in Leviticus 16 for Israel on the Day of Atonement when that one goat 
became the blood offering that God required, and the second goat became the scapegoat, the high priest would place his hands upon the head of that scapegoat, confess the sins of the entire nation upon that goat, and it would be taken way out in the wilderness where it would never come back into the camp. Cast off a cliff. And that goat had the sins of Israel upon it. Two goats, one offering. The necessity of a blood sacrifice and that scapegoat, unjustly, but suffering, taking the sins of the nation upon itself. One chapter later, Leviticus 17, verse 11, we are told, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. God requires a blood sacrifice. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. This principle of a blood sacrifice that we find earlier, Leviticus 16, with the high priest going into the Holy of Holies for the nation, is established forever with this verse. You know, if you ever have the opportunity in talking to a Jewish person, you might ask them. You know, Moses has told us that we require a blood sacrifice. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Where is your blood sacrifice today. There's no temple. Now, they won't have an answer. Perhaps they'll say it's good works. But this principle of blood sacrifice has never been abrogated, never been done away with. We all need a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, Jew or Gentile. So prophetically, what this speaks of is the salvation of the nation of Israel. Remember, the high priest was to confess on that scapegoat all the sins of the people, of the nation. So prophetically, it speaks of Israel being saved as a nation. In Romans 11, we are told exactly that will take place in the future. Verses 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. <clears throat> all Jewish people who make it to the end of the tribulation period <clears throat> shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, Jacob being Israel. All Israel will be saved, not every Jew who's ever lived. But we know from other scriptures, all the Jewish people who make it to the end of the tribulation period, the entire nation, as the Jews have gone back to Israel, and ultimately to Jerusalem because of the persecution of the Antichrist and the nations of the world. Isaiah 66 tells us the same type of thing. Speaking of Israel, before she, Israel, travailed, travail being a term speaking of the coming seven-year tribulation period, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Now, the tribulation period is still future. And before that period of time, she was delivered of a man-child. Some 2,000 years ago, Israel brought into the world Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the man-child. In the near future, I believe, she's going to go through those birth pains of the tribulation. 
Verse 8 asks this question. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? See, travail is the word in the Hebrew for birth pains. Before the birth pain, she brought forth a child. That's, that's contrary to the natural order of things. Who had heard such a thing is the question asked. Who has seen such things? Well, nobody. Then the question. Shall a nation be born at once? Well, the answer there is yes. For as soon as Zion travailed, when she goes through the birth pains, that's the tribulation period, for as soon as Zion travailed, Israel, she brought forth her children, all the nation that makes it to the end of the tribulation period shall be delivered, saved. The question is then asked, shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Will the Jewish people be stillborn? Will Israel die prior to the birth because of what the Antichrist and the nations attempt? No, can't happen. God will not let it come to pass. And Israel will be born in one day. Not 1948. Many try to say this passage speaks of 1948. No way. Not the context. It speaks of Israel as a nation coming to know the Lord at the end of the tribulation period. When Zechariah 12.10 says, They look upon me whom they have pierced. They look on Jesus, the Lord, whom they have pierced. The whole nation coming to the Lord. Messianic, it speaks of Jesus, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. He is the substance of these feasts when we look at it messianically. It speaks of Jesus being accepted by the Jewish people, Zechariah 12, 10, which I just mentioned. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. That is God pouring that out. And they, the nation of Israel, who's made it to the end of the tribulation period, read all of Zechariah 12, starting in verse 1. And they shall look upon me, the Lord speaking, Jehovah, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. All the nation, all the Jews remaining, look upon him whom they have pierced, Jesus. Prophetically, it speaks of Jesus being received by Israel as their Messiah and Savior. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. A future day when all Israel will be saved. What a day that will be. But preceding that, seven years of travail. Next time we will finish our lessons by looking at that final feast, Sukkot, Tabernacles. I look forward to looking into that with you. Shalom.